Okay, just checking my teeth. Been using some whitener. See if it works. You tell me. Leave a message in the comments. So uh, this week I will be talking with, chatting with, speaking with Susan Rice, who has been doing it all for, um, boy, she told me 38 years in comedy and is still active and working hard. Very funny lady. And I, she started a few years before I did. So I remember opening for Susan years ago. And um, anyway, let's uh, not waste any more time. I should be standing up, and I, probably, I will try not to leave you guys out of this. I, I, uh, I, I have a bad, I have a bad knee. Uh, it just, it just is the part of the deal. It's part of getting older. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, it's a bitch getting older. Uh, I don't. It, your family just, God, they just all of a sudden. If you give, if you have something that you are diagnosed with, and it's not going to kill you, just shut the hell up. <laughs> don't say anything to anybody. It's the worst thing you can do. You know, if, how are you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> just learned a lot because the minute they know, it just opens up this whole can of worms. Everybody's calling you, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Oh my God, Christmas. I thought it's going to go crazy at Christmas. I couldn't sit down. I, everybody walking by going, how are you? Are you okay? I'm wet. We're earbudded up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was watching your uh, uh, one of your <laughs> most recent videos, and you're you're funnier than ever. And you were talking about you were talking about your knee. How's your how's your knee doing? It's uh, not good, but it's. Um, I was um, yeah. I shot uh, we shot some great video in Canada. I got out of Canada just as the pandemic hit. Oh, okay. uh, the States last March, a, a year ago, March. And uh, uh, yeah, I've been hobbling on it now for about seven years. And the um, yeah, it's not, it's going to get fixed, but it's, it's a, the process is not just a replacement. It's a long process. So yeah, Sorry I'm in the, I'm in the midst of fixing it though. And I'm still going to work. I, you know, whoever will have me, they just have to make sure I can get off the stage. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that was hilarious. I'm gonna play if you don't mind. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a couple of short clips from YouTube of yours. Sure, on. sure. So uh, yeah, yeah. Just so, the the most ahead. recent ones, yeah. You just you know they they take you into those rooms. They go to the doctor's office, and they have this big. They're gonna do all these tests on you, and they 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 put you in that that I like the gown though. <laughs> I like the gown. Sometimes I just ask to wear it anyway. And they leave you in there. They leave you in there they, all by yourself. Just go through the drawers. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, just take shit. It doesn't matter. You're going to get billed for it anyway. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I got three gowns at home. I do. I, I do. I do. <laughs> No, they, they're my Saturday morning outfit. I don't, I don't put them on and just answer the door. I, I, well, I would love to hear about Jesus. You, you come on in. And I'm much thinner now than I, I'm much thinner than. <laughs> the most recent one? No, you have no control. Uh, okay, I have no, okay, I know, don't tell me that to me, I'm a terrible control freak. Um, yeah, um, part of the deal is I'm, uh, I'm having to lose weight uh, to get this knee able to get it fixed, so, yeah. but that's good, because I've been doing that, so. Well, good, good, yeah, yeah. And I need to lose some weight, too, and I don't even have a knee problem, so. Well, everybody, it's the COVID thing, I think everybody yeah. put weight on. I've gained well, 20 pounds. See, my COVID started when I was eight. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so it's different. <laughs> Mine's been intermittent throughout my life. I've had a yo yo COVID. Yeah, you, you know, it was hard on the road. It's really hard on the road. Um, there was guys that were so disciplined. Were you, were you one of those guys that would get up in the morning, you know, drink coffee and then read the paper and go to the gym for three hours and then no. have lunch and sleep? That was what uh, we did. Right. No, no. I, I'm one of those guys. What, what, well, I haven't, I did, I've done one get one weekend now. Last weekend was my first gig. In oh, over a year. good. Oh, I'm dying to know how that went. Yeah. But, but I'm one of those, these road guys that would sleep <laughs> until I woke up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and in the afternoon, I'd go for a jog. I did, I did do that. I'm a, I've been a runner. So I, I did oh. do that. But that, that was about it. And I, I remember working with David Crow. And I, when I told him what my day was like, he just looked at me with disgust. <laughs> I know. Oh, I know. Nobody is more motivated in their life than David Crow. Yeah. He's just like, I'm going to write a book, then yeah. I'm going to exercise, and then I'm going to go for a run, and then I'm going to create a symphony, and then I'm going to, you know, it's just like, yeah. okay. I know, he was, he was telling me, he was telling me about how, yeah, I got up this morning at seven o'clock, went over to my brother's house, and I helped him put a floor in, in his house, and uh, what, he, what did you do? <laughs> when I told him, he just got this look of, really? I know. I checked my pulse. And I, <laughs> so I knew that I, I I could get on stage tonight. So we're okay. Yeah. I made it to the show. It was, it was, but it was used to be, it was really hard on the road to, um, first of all, to eat correctly because sometimes you were stranded, you know, in a hotel that didn't have a restaurant or it was yeah. snowing, uh, you know, drifts and yeah. there was, you couldn't get across the street or it was, you know, you were eating out of the vending machine sometimes and, yeah. or you wait to eat at the club. And by that time it was late at night and you were eating a big greasy burger or something. It was, it was difficult to eat correctly on the road. And I knew comics that would take their food on the road with them. I thought I got to schlep enough. I'm not going to take groceries with me, <laughs> you know, but, uh, uh, you always had your car. I didn't always have my car in the beginning. I, I'd have to, I'd fly in and ride with people. A lot of people. Right, right, right. That makes it more difficult. I learned, well, I started the way you described it. That's how I started my meals on the road. But then I learned, I got married, I had kids. I learned, became domesticized. And, and frugal. I, I yeah. <laughs> grocery store. And, and, and mo most of the motels and hotels had, had refrigerators, mini fridges. Right. So. I started doing groceries and I always had a car. You're right. Oh, the other thing I want to add before I forget is um, my sister is, is, is my biggest motivator in doing these things uh, oh, and that's these, great. These videos. And I, yeah, I'm really happy about that because I talked about doing this for, for years. You've been doing it for years. I've been talking about doing it for years. Well, I get it. It's just, it's new technology. I mean, it's technology. I mean, I, you know, everything is, has changed so drastically. I didn't se start selling merch until about, I'm going to say four years ago. Oh, wow. That was the first time I sold merch. Right. And everybody went, you're not selling merch. I go, no, no, no I got nothing to sell. I mean, yeah. I'm just, I did my job, you know? And then I realized, wow, this is really stupid not selling this stuff because you make an extra, you know, so hundred, hundred or whatever. So, so some weeks you make as much selling merch as you do working the or gig. More, yeah. Or more, yeah. yeah. Some, some weeks, some nights you don't sell anything, but some weeks you do really well. So yeah. Yeah, and I just have one thing, and I'm just like, people ask me if I have a CD, and I go, you don't want that. You don't <laughs> want that. That's not, no, let's not do that. <laughs> Are you like me? Do you, hate, do you hate listening to yourself? Oh my God. It's just terrible. <laughs> what, what, how long have you been doing this now? How long have you been at I'm it? I'm going on 30 years. See, I just, Art and I just passed our 38th on, oh. uh, in March this year. Yeah. And, uh, we were roommates. Art Krug and I were roommates. Oh, I'm sorry. What, what I want to start it mentioning my my sister one, one of the oh, i'm sorry yes yeah one of the things she gives me feedback on is that we, when we're talking we mention these names and she doesn't know who they are 
So what I'm doing now is I'm encouraging anybody. What, if we mention a name like David Crow, fantastic comic, talented. Best dry player. bar, one of the best dry bars out there. Yeah. So uh, if you hear that, us mention names, Art Crew, great comic. Google, yeah, Google. Google these people because yeah. it, this 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 vlog, or if that's what you call it these days, is all mm -hmm. about the funniest people you've never heard of. And I don't mean that as an insult. I just no, mean it's not. You're not Jerry Seinfeld. You're, you're you're a working comic and a right. funny working comic and well you you you're funny enough to have sustained a really you know a career correct a career, yeah made a yeah. living at it for for made years, a living at it which is you, yeah which is hard for these kids to do now it's very yeah. difficult for them to to do that so uh and i say kids i'm talking about people in their 30s you know but right it's, uh, yeah, and so Art and I were, um, see, we started in 83 in Portland, and you started in Boise, though, did you not? Or no, you? I started in L.A. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, yeah. I actually, yeah, I actually started in 77 was my first time on stage, yeah. uh, and uh, I've, got, I've got an episode about that and how horrible, it, I went to the comedy store my yeah. very first time on stage in front of yeah. a packed house, and uh, I was, was miserable. Yeah. <laughs> but the but comedy, I quit. comedy store was hard any night. Yeah, well, it was, it was especially hard. hard when you didn't know anything about stand up comedy <laughs> and you wrote and you wrote your act the night before, you know. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but I quit in 80 and I got back in in 89. So I'm sorry, you go ahead. You started well, in 83 and you stayed with it. Well, um, yeah, I, I, uh, Art and I had done theater together in Portland prior to that. And we were roommates. We laugh about the apartment that we had, which was, it was a duplex and it was absolutely stunning. So we do so have you could, something you couldn't touch for less than two grand a month. Now we paid, right. I think the two of us, each of us paid $140 a month. Okay. I thought you were being sarcastic when you said no. stunning. No. No, it was amazing. But yeah. we lived, we lived together, and we and Art was Art was the comedy aficionado. He knew comedy a lot, and I had been I had been a comedian actress, and had was professionally trained, uh, and had done that for nine years, seven nine years, and seven to nine years prior to that, and um, he kind of challenged me because I was writing a one woman show. And I didn't know where to work it out. And I looked up in the local, you know, every city has a little events rag that you read every week with all the kinds of stuff that's happening in town. And I went and uh, I went and stood there and watched it one night. And I mean, the caliber that I saw on stage was amazing. Dave Anderson was on stage. Dave Anderson is another comic that people should look up. He's right. the best. He's the best crowd crowd worker I've ever met in my life. One of the first headliners I worked with when I hit the road, yeah. And just no one could talk to the audience like Dave Anderson. He just, it was amazing what he did. And he was on stage and so we started and I started two weeks before art and then, um, and uh, two months about, I worked my job for two more years and I quit in, eight, in 85. And one of the, one of the things I love to tell these kids because they go, you've been doing it for so long, you know? Right. Oh yeah. But you know, when I quit my day job, I tripled my income. That's how much work there was. Yeah. The comedy, you were in the middle of the boom, the big and, boom. Yeah. And it was, I should have quit two years after before that, but I quit in 85 and I was working for a bank that paid nothing. I think I was making two thirty-two an hour, plus tips. You know, at a bank, at yeah. a you don't get tips. You, just, you know, I was making nothing, so it was just one of those things. And so, um, and it's harder for them now. It's harder for the kids to. We just, I see. I'll just ramble on. So please stop me. Um, no, no, it's your story. We just interviewed. Um, uh, Andrew Slater, who is a great comic. He's out of Seattle originally. And um, he was, uh, 
he's young and stuff and he has a podcast too and he he interviewed this young kid out of Seattle that I've worked with and this is one of these things that you just kind of go oh no and this kid had been working up to quitting his job and he had a really good job he had a really good job and he was working it up and he saved his money and he quit on March 7th 2020 <laughs> He but quit his day job and COVID, up. COVID up. hit. Right. He right. got stuck in Oklahoma in a in in the Looney Bins comedy condo, which you know how bad that is. He's sitting there and they're shutting down the airports everywhere. Oh, wow. It's like, why did I quit my day job? I'm thinking, oh, that's terrible. That's a terrible story. That's but, the time. That's I. Makes me feel better though, because because I quit comedy in 1980, just as the boom was coming over the horizon. I d I've been doing it for three years in LA for no money, and then quit, and then all of a sudden everybody I knew was working, and I was driving cab, and it took me eight years to get back into comedy. So I mean, uh, but the, his timing is worse. His timing. Yeah, was here's, that was terrible. That's a terrible thing to have happen to you. Yeah, but um, I think. I think what did he do? Oh, he worked for he worked for the Seattle Food Bank. And no, no, but I mean, what what did he do? Oh, he finally got home. He called his friends and he and he he got he got uh, one of the I think he got one of the last planes before they grounded, or he took a bus home. I can't remember, but oh, it was it was hard. He had to he had he had no money. He hadn't been paid. He had, he'd only done like one show or something like that. Wow. And um, he got paid for that, and then he was stuck. And so he got he got he got back to Seattle, but it was just like then he was like my you know, and then he begged for his job back, and they gave him his job back because oh, yeah. they needed him. But it's just one of those things, you know, how when you were starting out, you just you you ate, you drank, you slept, you breathed comedy. Yeah. For like five years, that's all you thought about. That was, you were so focused and you would take your little notebook and go to a coffee shop and write your little brains out and get nothing, but it was, you were doing your job, you know? And um, it was kind of, it was kind of glamorous until you went on the road for, it got old. <laughs> it, the road got old pretty th I mean I was okay because I was a novelty because when I started out I could count on I could count on I could count about 10 women that were on the road at that time and years ago I found out because Newsweek did an article in 84 about or 86 about stand-up comedy in the country and how it was a huge boom and they they really only counted about twenty women that were actually on the road working. Yeah. And there was only like two hundred women, and they were counting comedy actresses, not stand ups. Mm. So it was like um, I had a lot of work. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. No, I, I remember that uh, when I was starting out too. I mean, uh, women were at a disadvantage because it was kind of a male culture, but. On the other hand, there was also an advantage when they wanted a woman on the bill. Uh, there weren't that many women. Well, they could sell tickets with a woman on the bill. And they could sell tickets. I would. Yeah. You did one of my shows at the Nampa Civic Center. That was so much fun. And and I always yeah I always had at least one woman on on the on the bill. Uh, just well, we because, had like, just we had because five. Of, what's that? <laughs> Well, we were all women that night. Oh, that you night. did, yeah, you did a, you did a late, uh, uh, yeah, the gas. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 right, right. But I will always have at least one woman on the bill. Uh, yeah. Not, not just to support women, but all, but to support the women in the audience. Well, it it it's it it became blatantly. Um, uh, I mean, as as the eighties and nineties progressed, especially the nineties, it became very very obvious that i mean they used to call them sausage shows you know right. <laughs> because there was you know there were and the women's movement was was gaining ground and it was like this is stupid 
because they wouldn't put two women on the show. Right, right. I remember speaking to Nora Ephron. Um, no, no, Nora. Um, oh, God, what's her name? Anyway, well, I did speak to Nora Ephron about this. I got a chance to talk to her at Igneous one night. But it's, it's one of those things where um, it was, if, if, if you had two women on the show, they named it the women's show. Right. Even if the guy was a headliner, it was the women's show. It was like, what? What is that? You know, I didn't understand that. But um, I, uh, there was so much demand between 80, probably 82 and 80, I'm going to say 89. There was so much demand for, um, for female headliners that, um, and there weren't that many. There was, you know, Sheila Kay and Diane Ford and um, uh, Paula Poundstone and Ellen, uh, but there, there were few and far between. And so um, I got moved up fast and that, that was scary. Margaret Cho talked about that. Margaret Cho got moved up too fast. She did her first Carson. She did her first Tonight Show, and she got booked for a, a huge arena in Hawaii. She had to do an hour and a half. No, no. She had fifteen minutes. Right. And she took the gig. Right. And it she tanked. Right. And it's one of those things. I mean, it's it, that's everybody experienced that. Wendy Lieber, yeah. Liebman also had you know she got moved fast, and you know you just kind of. But guys got moved up fast too. Yeah, and, and that's the that's the thing about li- starting out in in L.A. You were at a disadvantage, believe it or not, because you didn't get as much. You got five minutes stage times. Max. You didn't get a chance to. Yeah, you didn't get to to spread your wings a little bit and build no. your build your half hour. No, that's why I went on the road as soon as I possibly could. Uh, you know, even if if the if it was, you know, eight hour drives to one nighters, because I'd get 30 minutes instead of three or three to five. I know it, yeah. it just, yeah, it, uh, it was such a, it was, we starting in a smaller market really built. I mean, it, when we started in 83 in March, by June, I had my first paid gig. That's amazing. That's unheard of. Yeah. Oh Yeah. When I when I was started in 77, 78, 79, there was there was I think there was maybe two or three comics actually working in a major club that I was hanging out that were actually getting paid work yeah. in a major club. George Wallace used to come in. He was the big he was like, whoa, wow, this guy's a real comedian. Yeah. And I mean, Kevin Nealon was there and I mean, a bunch of people that, you know, now that are but they weren't getting paid. And um, you worked for bands back in those days. The ones that did get paid would open for bands. Right. It exactly. With the comedy clubs. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, and those, you, and we went to Canada. That was, oh, Jesus. <laughs> that was an education. Going to Canada was an education because it was, it was the wild west up there on, on the island, on Vancouver Island. And Stu Scott. Yeah, Stu Scott and uh, and his partner Danny, um, and uh, I mean it was I got such an education because I was I'd been an actress I you know and I couldn't stand the theater anymore and I I didn't you know and I was older I was older than a lot of comics that were starting out even then I was older. Um, because I was 31, going to be 32, um, when I started my, when I first went on stage as a stand-up, and everybody else was in their 20s. I mean, John Johnston, another comic you should look up, Mr. Bagpipes, he, uh, he wasn't old enough to be in the bars, but he was there because he could grow a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and uh, he was tall and nobody questioned it, even though if you talk to him for five minutes, you kind of go, this guy's like 16. Uh (laughs) He's just this young pup. But um, he, uh, 
and and everybody else was a lot younger but um yeah we used to go up there and they you'd walk into the into the office to get paid especially with Stu and danny and there'd be a there'd be a, a mound of coke on the table and there would be a wad of cash and they go which do you want and you kind of go well i'll take the cash you know because i have to cross the border <laughs> and i'll buy a coke when i get home i know it's like i i didn't and i never got it i never did all that because i'd already done all that i mean i had you know that was i was focused and um uh i uh yeah and you worked in strip clubs a lot that you know especially in canada I think the, one of my favorites was up in Nanaimo. Did you ever work in Nanaimo? Oh, yeah. In, in the old ice rink? No. Where they had the calls. They had a full-blown live Calistoga wagon suspended over this ice rink that they had made into this comedy club or this band. It was a dance club. And, they, of course, there was no ice. But there was, it, that's what it had been. They put a stage and tables on the, where the ice should have been? No, no. No, they let people sit in the arena area. No. And you they put the the stage in the middle of the arena. Right. Right below the wagon. Oh, nice. And when they hated you, they'd yell <laughs> drop drop the wagon. <laughs> I, like, I got drop the wagon. <laughs> I was scared to death. I'm going, they're not really gonna drop the wagon, are they? <laughs> you know. But just scary it was very yeah i it was crazy i was uh i was with lee mckay and jeb fink and i i got an education that weekend and i hadn't i'd only been in stand-up less than nine months so it was crazy yeah that was i remember working vancouver island a few times and uh, uh those could be some tough rooms yeah some some of the club, I mean, the clubs in Canada, though, I found to be the greatest, uh, like the, the full time clubs, the one nighters were the. Oh, I never got to those. <laughs> oh, you didn't? No. no. Oh, I did. I did. I did. Danny Robinson used to uh, book a, a room up in Cal. Was it Calgary or? Yeah, Calgary. He had a great room. That was a great room. I think that was a what was the one that I think it was a Yucks, wasn't it? A Yuck Yucks. Well, there, I know there was a Yuck. I never worked for Yucks, but I worked for Jokers in Calgary. Uh, That's it. That's the one I worked for. That, yeah. But they, they, they also smoked their body weight in, in, in cigarettes and drank, you know, drank those big Molsons and, uh, and nobody opened a window. So by the second show in the wintertime, they had, and they had, they had no smoke eaters. Do you remember working in rooms like that? That was just... I know. I, and now it seems so foreign. I, I remember when they first... God. California was one of the first states to uh, outlaw smoking indoors and bars, and which really surprised the hell out of me. I was so I, used I, to I, working in yeah. rooms. Well, yeah. Canada, you couldn't... I couldn't put makeup on. I would put makeup on, and by the middle of this... the My set, the first show... I had it. Had, I, my eyes had watered so bad it was completely off my face. Yeah. And the, by the second show, I couldn't see the second row. That's how smoky it was. I literally could not see them. Yeah. With the lights and the smoke, and you just, and I just, I would stand up there and beg, please, somebody open a window, please, just open a window. I don't care if it's four below. I don't care, you know. And I just, I couldn't go back. It would. That was just too hard. No, I mean, I for weeks after that, I would, I hung my clothes outside. I washed them. I hung them outside. It just couldn't get any of the smoke out of them. It was just gross. So glad that happened, but you can't smoke inside anymore. It's just yeah. great. Yeah, and that, it's been a long time now. It just seems seems foreign to think that you actually could smoke indoors. Right. Some some places you still can. I think casinos on reservations and things like that. Yeah, because you walk through the casino and you forget, and you yeah. kind of go, "Oh yeah, it's a casino. It's an Indian casino." Yeah, whoo. Right. Yeah, it's um, 
but you can't in the showrooms, which is good because they that you can't do that. You can't have dancers up there, you know, huffing and puffing and having that. I mean, you just can't do that. Yeah. But anyway, um, so um, it was uh, it was a long. I was I was literally on the road for about twenty two years solid, uh, and then the bottom fell out of stand up. Um, about I'm going to say about ninety. It fell out in the early nineties, but I still worked a lot because I had started working ships. Uh huh. And um, I was still working enough to keep my head afloat in LA, which was. Yeah, that's a neat trick. Yeah, well, it got to the point where it was ridiculous because I was gone so much and there wasn't an agent in town that was, that was going to carry me because I was never home. Right. That, uh, that's the whole, the whole um irony of, of going to LA as a stand-up comic you've got to go on the road to make a living and you're not there when they need you for auditions and so you got to get you have to get a day job so you can do auditions and well and by that time too I mean in the 80s when you were down in LA because I moved to 80 I moved in 86 to LA and we we both knew comics that were getting huge holding deals right they give they give them a hundred grand to stay home Right. Because we're going to build something around you. Yeah. You know? I think I, I met Ellen just before she hit really big. Um, that's a great story. I, had a, I hadn't been in L.A. very, I hadn't been in L.A. probably more than, I, I lived at Long Beach, out in Long Beach, which was a big mistake. Because I moved to Long Beach first. And I should have moved to the city. Because once you're at the beach, you just kind of go, oh, this is really nice. I, just, I don't want to go into town at all. I just like it out here. You know, so that was a wash. And But when I moved in, into town, I hadn't been in town in, in Hollywood for more than three weeks. And Dave Anderson and Jeff Stilson, another great comic from Seattle. Um, uh, I was going to pick him up at the airport. Never been to the airport. Never driven from, L, from my house to the airport, you know, and, so I got there and I had a little Volkswagen and here comes, here comes Dave and, and, and Jeff with all their golf clubs. God, you guys used to schlep the golf clubs, the oh golf clubs and their bags. And here comes, and they've got this really nice woman. And I look at her and I go, why do I know her? And then I realize, oh my God, that's Ellen DeGeneres. And she's carrying a big box. She'd been in Seattle at the underground with Jeff. She's got a big box with her and her luggage. And I've got a 74 Super Beetle. I mean, there's no place to put anything. So I told the boys, you're sitting on the golf clubs because I have no place to put them. And I get, you know, we all pack in the car and stuff. And I got so lost. And I had Ellen going, this is not the way we go. I, go, I don't know where I'm going. But I mean, I was, you, you were put in situations then and you met people that were just going to explode. You know, that Volkswagen saw a lot of famous people. Let right. me just tell you that. I picked up a lot of famous people at the airport because I picked up my Seinfeld. Phone. I picked up Seinfeld. Oh, did you? No, I, yeah. I meant, you know, uh, having co comedians having coffee in cars. Uh, you did it. Oh, I know. Them. Yeah, that's a great. But I, I got, I had, uh, I worked with Jerry Seinfeld early on in my career again, like the summer of 84 or 85. I think it was 85 and uh, he got hired uh, just before he, I mean, we knew who he was because he'd been on Letterman so much and, and he'd done Carson, but if you didn't stay up late, you didn't know who he was, you know, and if you weren't a comedy aficionado, but he was just getting ready to, to break. And he, there was a place called, did you ever work for Laura and Ron, Laura Crocker and Ron Reed in Seattle. Yep. Okay, so yes, you did. Of course you did. Well, they had that gig out on uh, Commencement Bay in Tacoma called Shenanigans. It was a beautiful old rest. It was a beautiful restaurant. And there was a restaurant and then upstairs with this beautiful view of, the, of Puget Sound was the bar. And it sat maybe, I think they crammed in almost 200 people up there. 
And she just pumped the hell out of this, this show. But she put nine comics on in front of Jerry Seinfeld. Nice. But I was the only one with a working car. <laughs> so she called me that afternoon and said, hey, can you pick up Jerry at, at the Olympian Hotel in Seattle and drive him to the gig? And I said, yes, what does he look like? I don't know him. And she said, oh. So I went into the, I parked the car in Seattle and I went into the Olympian lobby and he was standing there and I didn't really know him. And I said, are you Jerry Seinfeld? And he said, yes, I am. I said, well, I think I'm your ride. And as we're walking out the door, he goes, you probably have a Volkswagen, don't you? And I was like, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but luckily he loves Volkswagen. So it worked out. I said, we only have about 45 minutes to drive. So it's not a long drive. Do you want to hear this story? This is a really kind of a good road story. Did yes. you know this? Okay. Because like right. yeah. I will just keep talking. I have nobody to talk to. So you, well, you got me today. Okay, good. So um, I have a day job at this point. I still have my day job. So it had to be, it had to be just before I quit. So it was 85. And I, I, uh, I took him to, we went to the gig. We got out of the car. We went into the gig. Now I didn't realize um, how many comics were going to be on the show and how drunk these people were going to be. Cause they had been there since three o'clock in the afternoon drinking. Right. And they had all their boats out on the, you know, parked at the dock and stuff and the parking lot was full so I go in there and I tell Laura I said I'm you know I I really want to stay to see him but I may not have to I I have to work tomorrow morning and it was a Sunday and I said I gotta work tomorrow morning so I'm probably going to do my show and watch as much as I can because I always like to watch the comics because you should watch the comics and I was going to have to leave early I thought so she said, okay. So she put me on pretty early and I tanked. It was terrible. But when I realized how many comics and he was like, he was downstairs and I went down and I said, you know, there's a lot of comics going on in front of you. And he was like, what? I went, yeah. So he came upstairs and we watched and I, I snuck out and I got in my car and I, I started down the road and I looked at the gas tank and I went, oh, so I'm on I-5. I'm about a half an hour away. Now I've already, it's about a half an hour. I look at the gas tank. I go, I got to pull over and get some gas. Reach down from my purse. There's Jerry Seinfeld's man purse on the floor of my car. Because he thought I was going to be his ride back to Seattle. Oh. And now I'm going, oh shit. So I had to get gas. I got gas. I pulled out. I drove 80 miles an hour in downtown Tacoma to get out to Commencement Bay and the show was over and all the cars are coming this way and I'm going I'm watching and I'm thinking who's he going to be with he's going to be with Laura and I don't know what they're driving so I'm looking in I'm looking in cars like this you know and all of a sudden I'm driving really slow and everybody's passing me really fast and all of a sudden I see Jerry Seinfeld pressed against the glass of this sedan in the back window going no <laughs> and I'm, I'm going I slam on my brakes and I pull over and finally Ron turned the car around and he 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 was just like I can't believe you came back I said I can't believe you left your shit in my car <laughs> and he goes I thought, I said, who doesn't take every, it had everything. It had his passport. It had his airline ticket. It had money in it. It had everything. I went through it. And so anyway, so as I'm getting back in my car, he goes, listen, he says, I, I, I I'm in LA. If you, if you ever get to LA and you need anything, you, you get a hold of me and I'll, whatever I can do for you. And I said, oh, I'm going to take you up on that. <laughs> so anyway, and I could tell the whole story about skipping forward about five years and running into him. Anyway, it was. Oh, yeah, oh, so you never took him up on it? 
uh, no, but I told him to stop stepping on my dress. Oh, he, uh, he kept bumping me off. I had a, I had, I had one of my first, um, I had a, a television show coming up and I needed, I needed stage time. And every time I, I had arranged time at the store or at the comic at the, at the, at the improv or at Igby's or at the ice house, Seinfeld bumped me. He'd come in and bump me. And I was the only woman. I mean, it was like Jan felt really bad. And I said, well, you know, there's three other guys you could bump. You know, what's the deal? And I told him, listen, I'm trying to, I got a set I got to do and I have to work it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I ran into him at the improv and uh, he's, I actually stepped on Leno's foot. He turned around and there was Jerry and I said, you, I need to talk to you. And he, go, <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, I know you. I said, yeah, you do know me. And I saved your little ass one night. <laughs> and I want you to, I want you to get off my dress. Every time I need a set, you bump me. He goes, I didn't know I was bumping you. I said, well, knock it off. Why don't you <laughs> ask if you're coming into a club, just showing up, why don't you ask who you're bumping and if they need the time? And he said, I'm so sorry. I said, well, that's just common courtesy, you know? And he goes, I will promise I will not bump you again. And I said, I will make sure you don't. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it was very yeah. funny. Well, if, if uh, by some miracle, my career ever gets to the point where I start bumping people, I'll remember that. Well, I, you know, it was, it, was <laughs> it was commonplace, but it just seemed to be me every well, time. Oh, yeah. No, no. I, I remember that. I mean, in L.A., I, I was a regular at the L.A. Cabaret in the uh, in the 90s, uh, late 80s when I got came back in and uh, I would get uh, Howie Mandel used to bump me. Yeah. And uh, and and uh, I, but they, I, he would only bump me one spot. So I had to follow him, which is I was I I, and I'm a beginner and I've got to follow this guy that gets a standing ovation just for showing up. You know, so know. which it's, which, it's which was a real learning experience because the first time I let it affect me, it was like, oh my God, I'm following Howie Mandel. I know, the but it's time, hard. It's hard to do that. Yeah, and the next time it was like, okay, I'm just going to block it on my mind. I'm going to pretend he wasn't even there, and that and everything went fine. I got um, the first time I worked. Um, <sighs> I knew it was going to happen. I was in New York, my first time in New York, and I'm working at Catch. I'm working at Catch. Stilson got me, Jeff Stilson got me a set at Catch. I was really excited. I got off the plane, got on the bus, got to Port Authority, almost got mugged by a, 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 a rogue cab driver. Guy saved me. He goes, you don't want to go with him. Come on, I'll share a cab with you. And so got to my, my friend's house in Chelsea, literally changed my clothes, went back. She told me, go down to the corner and either catch the subway or get a cab. I'm thinking I'm getting a cab. I know the address. So I got a cab and I got to the place and uh, I had my time all set. I was all ready to go. And Chris, you're intimidated anyway. You're in New York City. You're at Catch a Rising Star. I was like, pinch me, pinch me. And I wasn't a novice at this time. I'd been in the business a while by that time. So I thought, just be cool. And here comes Brett Butler. And she wanted to set, so she bumped me. And I, I had to follow her. And she was the queen in New York. I was like, okay. I got up there and said, hey, hi, how are you? <laughs> it was just so stupid. It was like ridiculous. Yeah. But, it, you know, and women were, you no. Know, I would, I was bumped by a lot of women on shows because they didn't want another woman on a show. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That was interesting. I never, I, I went, why? Yeah. You know, that's kind of stupid, but you know, it happened. So. Oh, there is a lot we could talk about in this business um, where we could get into politics and, and egos and and personalities and and uh yeah we could do that too 
You know, just, well, you know, you know what I, what I, I want to, because you run into this too when you work with, uh, with the younger comics. When I, I will admit, when I got into stand up, I knew comics because my, my mother loved comedy. And she used to wake me up because she was, she would watch, you know, Steve Allen and Jack Parr when they were running the Tonight Shows. And um, she would wake me up and, and go, come on, Toadie's on, you know, Toadie Fields. Sure. And I'd sneak down the hall with my blankie and I'd sit there and I'd just enjoy it completely, you know. And, you know, I saw Jonathan Winters on, on, on the Ed Sullivan show and I saw, you know, on, on Jack Parr. And then I saw, I mean, there was, we grew up knowing comedy, you know, and Lucille Ball was huge, but she was a comic actress. And that's what I, I used to sit there in my ear and try to make her faces. And, but today, uh, I work with, I'm working with these, this, these wonderful women. We're doing, we're going to do a festival. I'm putting on a festival in St. John's this summer okay. um, to, uh, to help this, my little St. John's neighborhood come back from COVID. And okay, St. John's, explain that. Oh, St. John's, I live in Portland, Oregon, and St. John's is actually, there's two old settlements in the Portland area, Oregon City, which is the oldest. And St. John's is the second oldest. Okay. And they sit at opposite ends of the Willamette, um, the Willamette River that runs through. I'm at the edge of the Willamette River where it falls, in, where it spills into the Columbia. Okay. And it's kind of a peninsula. And it's a beautiful bridge, the bridge that goes across the Willamette River um, is, was, was, is a suspension bridge like the Golden Gate Bridge. It's a beautiful bridge. And St. John's is just a little old neighborhood that was here in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's in the little downtown area it hasn't been gentrified like most of Portland has, you know, I mean, there's no new seasons, you know, and down, you know, this, it's not, it's still really kind of funky and fun, but it's been, it's been hit hard. And um, so we just thought we'd do a festival um it's going to be outdoors and stuff and it's we've never had a comedy festival and it's i'm using all local comedians well it's been so much fun talking to you yeah and, and thank and, you for doing this thanks for taking the time and there's so much more we could have talked about i'm a little chatty kathy so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and probably most of your audience doesn't know who chatty kathy is so there you go yeah. but anyway <laughs> thank you Thanks, Thanks for having Susan. Me. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.